The Soviet Mikoyan Guryevich MiG-15 used to dominate the Korean skies with its mighty armament suite, turn radius, and maximum speed at combat altitude. But by December of 1950, the Americans had finally leveled the ground against the Soviets in the area with the introduction of the legendary North American F-86 Sabre. Despite its weaknesses compared to its foe, the Sabre did not take long to establish supremacy over the Communists with its unmatched handling characteristics. The F-86 took part in the world's first large-scale fighter jet dogfights, but as outstanding as it was, the jet had one major flaw. It was not carrier-capable. Hence, the Navy put in motion the development of a machine that could take the F-86's power to the seas. The answer was the FJ-2 Fury. A new era. In late 1944, North American aviation entered a competition against Douglas and Vought to become the first operational jet aircraft in the United States Navy with its experimental fighter Jet No. 1. And it won. First sketched as the NA-135, the design eventually evolved into the notable FJ-1 Fury, an early transitional jet of the post-war era. The fighter jet was heavily based on the remarkable P-51 Mustang, North America's successful piston-engined aircraft. Mimicking its predecessor, the FJ-1 showcased tail surfaces, wing, and canopy that strongly resembled the legendary Mustang. Its airframe consisted of a straight-wing platform, tricycle landing gear, and a single turbojet passing through the fuselage. Minor changes included the relocation of an enclosed cockpit to accommodate the pilot further into the fuselage to ensure improved visibility in carrier operations. The prototype first flew in the fall of 1946, and a year later, the first of 30 examples was delivered. By the spring of 1948, the Navy Squadron VF-5A accomplished the first operational aircraft carrier landing of a jet fighter at sea for the U.S. Navy, marking a new era for naval aviation. Still, while the stunt aboard USS Boxer set a milestone for jet-powered carrier operations, it also underscored the need for catapult-assisted launches and arrested recoveries. In fact, the Fury could easily launch without external assistance, but whenever the deck was too crowded, its capabilities were undermined, for the aircraft demanded the entire extension of the current aircraft carriers. Without a catapult, the FJ-1 was exposed to a perilous, slow climb, too risky for normal operations. Thus, the first aircraft of the Fury series was allocated to testing, limiting it to moderate success of its own. Still, the straight-winged fighter jet would inspire a true legend. Sideways. In the first years of the post-war, reliable German research into swept wings was not yet widely available. As a result, the first iterations of the Fury were restricted to the standard at the time, with the back sweep needed to reduce transonic drag rise as flight speed approached the sound barrier. As soon as the concept emerged, it gave rise to a new chapter in aerodynamics, and the Navy's Fury morphed into a project of its own. The Air Force's outstanding Sabre jet was the United States' first swept-wing fighter, one that could finally counter the swept-wing Soviet MiGs in the Korean skies. Initially, the Experimental Pursuit 86 had a straight-wing planform directly derived from the first Fury, but in time, the original design evolved to incorporate swept wings that would lift the influential F-86 Sabre to soaring heights. Indeed, the Sabre engaged Soviet fighters in high-speed dogfights, some of the earliest jet-to-jet -jet battles in history. Unsurprisingly, the Sabre would be remembered among the best and most pivotal fighter aircraft in the Korean War. Not only that, but it would go down in history as one of the most important fighters altogether, both for its success and its legacy, as it was also capable of exceeding the speed of sound in a dive. Developed in the late 1940s, and already outdated by the end of the 1950s, the Sabre was adaptable and continued serving as a frontline fighter with numerous air forces. It is by far the most produced Western jet fighter, with 9,860 units in total. Still, there was an area where the Sabre fell short. It was not carrier-capable. 
In response, the Navy decided to convert the distinguished aircraft and create a fighter that would suit its necessities better. Specialist By 1951, it was evident that the Navy's existing straight-wing fighters were significantly inferior to their Soviet counterparts in the Korean theater. But the swept-wing fighters in the Sea Service's pipeline were not nearly ready for deployment. In response, the Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics issued a direct order to develop the already successful Sabre into a navalized version. The result was the North American FJ-2 Fury. However, the Endeavour had an inherent risk, as the Air Force's variant lacked the ability to operate from an aircraft carrier altogether. Still, Navy pilots had observed that the F-86 had a lower landing speed than that of the Grumman F-9F Panther. Taking advantage, North American claimed that its swept-wing saber was comparable to the top straight-wing fighters of the time in both handling and stall characteristics at low speeds. And as the Panther risked being removed from carrier operations, if it failed to reduce its stall speed by 12 miles per hour, the FJ-2 was rushed into production, with 300 examples ordered even before the prototypes had taken to the skies. The first Fury to fly was actually the third aircraft ordered, and its maiden flight took place on December 27, 1951. The new navalized Sabre differed from the standardized F-86E-10 only in its armament. Unlike the original, the Fury was mounted with four 20mm Colt Mark 12 cannons. The second and third aircraft to fly were unarmed, but eventually modified to be carrier-capable. Some of the Navy specifications included the Fury's folding wings, longer nose struts to improve the angle of attack when landing, and a tail hook. Despite the risks, the Air Force's Sabre was successfully converted to fulfill the Navy's requirements. Slings and Arrows The new FJ-2s were equipped with catapult fittings and were among the first aircraft to test state-of-the-art steam catapult on a U.S. Navy carrier. In August of 1952, the fighter conducted carrier trials aboard USS Midway and continued with carrier qualification trials on the USS Coral Sea. However, the results were less than satisfactory. Low speed handling was poor, and the arrestor hook and nose gear proved to be too feeble for operations. Still, the first production aircraft flew on November 22, 1952, incorporating carrier-based modifications. The aircraft featured a widened main landing gear. The outer wing panels folded upward, and the windscreen was enhanced to offer the pilot a better view during approach. Likewise, the production version showcased an all-moving flying tail without a dihedral. But many problems with the steam catapult continued to surface during the first launches. Eventually, several FJ-2s had to be fitted with a sturdier nose wheel strut. From the outside, the navalized variant was hard to tell apart from the original, except for the gun muzzles and the navy paint. Inside, however, the Fury received a General Electric J47 GE-2 engine, a derivative of the J47 GE-27 used in the F-86F. All the additional modifications rendered the naval Sabre about 1,100 pounds heavier than the Air Force aircraft. But still, the FJ-2 did not meet the expectations and fell short of a fully carrier-capable fighter. As such, it was decided to allocate the aircraft to land-based squadrons of the U.S. Marine Corps. Evolution As the Korean theater demanded more sabers, construction of the FJ-2 had to be slowed down. In fact, the model was not produced in large quantities until the conflict was over. By the end of 1953, only seven aircraft had been provided. Moreover, the first Fury delivered to a Marine squadron didn't arrive until early 1954. In addition, it was no surprise that the Navy preferred the lighter F-9F Cougar once it proved to have superior slow-speed performance, which was more adequate for carrier operations. As such, the 200 FJ-2s were delivered to the Marines instead. The U.S. Marine Corps tried to solve the type's handling problems regarding carrier operations and made several cruises aboard carriers, but the FJ-2 was never even satisfactory. 
In a couple of years, the model disappeared from frontline service altogether, and even reserve units retired it by 1957. But while the FJ-2's development was still ongoing, the Navy was already planning the next model, the FJ-3, a license-built version of the British Armstrong Siddeley Sapphire turbojet powered by the Wright J-65 engine. Relative to the J-47, the Sapphire promised a 28% increase in thrust for a minor increase in weight. To rest the engine, a single FJ-2 was modified, with a simple externally visible change regarding a deeper end tail to leave room for a more significant mass flow. Early on, the new variant showcased the same wing as the FJ-2, but the FJ-3 would eventually feature the so-called 6-3 wing, with an extended leading edge by 6 inches at the root and 3 inches at the tip. While first introduced on the F-86F, the modification enhanced the new variant's maneuverability, though at the expense of a slight increase in landing speed, because the leading edge slats were removed. In the end, the Navy was much more satisfied with the FJ-3 than it had been with its predecessor, and it was even superior to most versions of the F-86. A total of 538 were built, over twice the amount as the FJ-2. Eventually, the Navy would also pursue the final version of the Fury lineage, the FJ-4, but the fighter-bomber ultimately became a vastly different design. Thank you for watching our video. Don't hesitate to subscribe to Dark Skies and all the rest of our Dark Documentaries channels for more videos about military developments from the 20th and 21st centuries, and hit the bell icon to be notified of our newest content. Stay tuned.